Yes, it's uh, 3 p.m. In, uh, in Switzerland and time to start our second talk of the afternoon. It's my great pleasure to welcome Catherine Röder here uh, for, for this talk. She's an outstanding statistician, a very accomplished researcher in this field. Um, after a PhD in statistics at Pennsylvania State University, she was a professor at Yale and then uh, moved to, to Carnegie Mellon University where she's, where she's full professor since nine, 1998. And uh, I remember that I first heard about your work when I did a sabbatical at the Broad Institute and I was interested in the interface between machine learning and the life sciences. And they said, uh, look at, at uh, Professor Röder's uh, work, that's, that's outstanding. And uh, when I read your papers back then, I'm now really happy to, to really meet you here and host you for a talk now, uh, now almost, almost 10 years uh, later. But I realized over these 10 years, even though uh, we, uh, we hadn't met yet, but I realized that the, the high opinion that the colleagues at the Broad Institute had uh, was, uh, was shared by the whole community. So um, uh, Catherine was elected uh, to the most prestigious societies. Like the, she's a fellow of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics uh, of the American Statistical Association, the National Academy of Sciences and the American Association for the Advancement of sciences and she has won uh, numerous awards from the committee of the presidents of statistical societies. So all, all of these uh, reflect um, the high standing of her work. And we are very excited to have you here and to learn more about uh, selective inference in, uh, in uh, GBAS. Welcome and we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much. You know, I, I saw when, when we started emailing, I thought, now I know that name, I know that name, that's an unusual name and I'm glad you reminded me of when we had emailed uh, yeah. back when you were at Broad. So glad to get to meet you at least on Zoom now. Um, so um, thank you for inviting me and um, I look forward to sharing my work with you uh, this afternoon for you and this morning for me. I, I want to talk about um, how to improve power by using um, um, extra information that's, uh, there's so much uh, multi-omic data that we can use extra information in various tests. And we started off with uh, GWAS, not because we were most interested in GWAS, but because there was a lot of data and we felt we could really test things out there. Ultimately, we want to try these methods on um, um, genome wide as uh, we want to try them on whole genome sequencing for rare variants, but um, we're not finished with that yet. And I'm going to share with you the fairly successful investigation we made of GWAS. So um, for just a very quick review of that. So what's the idea? We've uh, tested many, many SNPs across the genome and we do a marginal test for every SNP to see if it's associated with the phenotype, say maybe um, schizophrenia. And um, this is, these are the results that we would get. And, um, and that's a happy result with a lot of signal above the, the significance threshold, but that's not always the case. And if, if that's not the case, we wanna to try to use extra information to improve the power. So we can summarize those data with our p-values, a p-value for many, many, many tests. And uh, for each test, it either is associated or it's not. And so it's null or non-null is the truth. And then we either uh, reject or we fail to reject. And we're of course worried about the, the false positives here where we rejected and we shouldn't. And R is the number of discoveries, the number of rejections we've made. And typically people really control very carefully. So they want the probability of any false positives to be less than alpha, which leads us to only reject if the p-value is less than five times 10 to the negative eight, which is quite stringent. Um, and, but that works well for uh, well-powered studies like schizophrenia. Can see there even in 2014, we had a lot of discoveries. But for autism, just look at the colored bars here for autism, even in 2019, after um, millions and millions of dollars, we have hardly any p-values crossing that threshold. 
And so we would, we would like to do better and to learn more about autism. And so um, we might consider instead using a false discovery rate. So instead of trying to control for any false positives, we might like to control so that the expected fraction of false positives is less than alpha. And that'll increase the power quite a bit, but still not enough with autism to have very many discoveries. And so um, we, want, we want to see if we can do more. So here's our p-values lined up, and those are maybe genes they're associated with. And, um, and of course, there'd be most of the SNPs wouldn't be associated, wouldn't be in a gene, but we might be able to map them to a gene based on which gene they're nearby and which gene they, they tend to drive the expression of. And so we could have um, X, which is this, what we call the side information. So any kind of information that may, might make us more likely to reject that um, test. And so, um, for instance, um, if we were studying schizophrenia, bipolar is very highly correlated with schizophrenia. The same SNPs tend to drive the signal. And so we could use the big studies of bipolar to increase the power of our schizophrenia test. And then um, um, also more interesting in a multi-elmic way is we might look to see which SNPs drive which genes, and if they have a very, because those are more likely causal SNPs, and if they drive a gene, in, in other words, they control the expression of it, um, if they have a very high impact, a big beta slope in that relationship there, whoops, then we, then we, we would maybe put, consider that extra information that that SNP is associate, associated. Um, another more interesting uh, side information is if we, if we looked at correlated genes based on gene expression and created um, communities of genes, which are often called modules, then we might say if a module has a lot of small p-values associated with it, then we would say other p-values that are on the order of being rejected, maybe they, we should reject them too, because this is obviously a, a functional set of genes and that are uh, important to this phenotype. So that's what we want to do. We want to gain that information. Now, quite a long time ago, 15 years ago, we wrote a paper uh, aiming to solve that problem in 2006. And it was a very simple idea where you just you would use get a weight based on the side information and you could in theory improve the power quite a bit and that was a big hit that paper was very very popular but the problem was there was hardly any side information 15 years ago multiomics really didn't exist but now the problem is the opposite we have an excess of information we have high dimensional many 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 things to include and now we don't know how to to determine before we couldn't determine the weights because there wasn't much information now there's a lot of information some of it good some of it not so good and we can't snoop in the data to decide so we need new methods be to build on these uh, ideas we had. But the main idea though really is always going to be that you use the side information to be more lenient with some p-values and less lenient with other p-values so that you all together spend your alpha wisely. Okay, and so the desired properties of this is we the covariates need to be independent of p value, the p value. You have to collect things like gene expression or other GWAS that are independent of your p value. And then we need to be able to explore these high dimensional spaces without snooping so that we can upweight the right um, features without taking a penalty too severe of a penalty for, 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 we must take a penalty for snooping, but we want the minimum penalty that still allows us to get greater power and yet maintain our false discovery. And so this is the idea. So this, this figure is extremely important for you to understand. So on the vertical axis, 
it's log minus log 10 p value. So the bigger the value, the more significant that test. Every point is the, the p value for a particular SNP. And then on the um, horizontal axis is possible side information, a scalar side information x. And the idea there is that um, if you did just a usual von Froning or a Benjamini Hochberg FDR control, you would you would reject any of the tests that were above the dot dashed line. And you, you can see there that X is obviously quite informative. The bigger X gets, the more small P values we have. We have a lot more up there um, with um, significant, significant results. And so, and hardly any, when X is small, there are no interest no small p values. So we should use that and draw that curved blue line. And then we can, we can tilt and reject more over there when there are a lot of them near the BH threshold. We'll tilt it down a little bit. And then at the expense of not rejecting over there on the left when x is small and nothing interesting is going on. And that, if we could learn that line, that blue line, we could have a much more powerful test. And so um, I'm now showing exactly the same thing, but I have changed the vertical axis to be the zero to one p-value. So now all of the significant ones are the blue points down there that are, um, I mean, well, actually this is a simulation. So all of the blue points are the actual signals, the truth, and you can see a lot of them have small p-values, but they only tend to have small p-values when x is big. And so we want to be able to find a lot of those. And so this is the test we're going to use. And um, we want to, um, the way we're going to do this, I feel like I, I, I missed something. Oh, yes, I forgot to acknowledge that this is work due to Lay and Fithian, and it's called the Ad ADAPT procedure. And it's for adaptive p value threshold. And so I don't, I don't want to take credit for this work, which is their work. And my work, it, the work of my team is bringing this uh, to fruition in genetics. Okay, so here we are. Let me explain how that ADAPT algorithm works. Okay, so there, this is the same figure as below, but now at the p-value of 0.5, I've drawn a boundary, a blue boundary just below at 0.45, and a red boundary, that's the mirror image at 0.55. And I'm going to reveal those p-values in the, the black ones. And now this is kind of extreme. I could make that much lower, make it more like at 0.05. But let's just suppose we started off with this huge rejection region. Any p-value less than 0.45, we consider rejecting that. And the point is, is the mirror image, the red points, those are pretty much all the null, all following the null hypothesis. So we're going to adjust the blue line and then the mirror image one will follow naturally. And we'll always find out if we're ready to quit when the estimated false discovery portion based on the red points is less than our threshold. So we count how many points are above the red line and we keep adjusting until that's less than say 0.05. So it's a, it's a clever it's a clever idea and then we're going to we're going to adjust the line using mostly the black lines but we'll also use the other data cleverly. Okay, so this is what it looks like. We start here. I'm just going to say we'll show you what the algorithm does and then I'll show you how it does it. So we start there and we say well that's pretty terrible. So I start rejecting a little less. And I'm going to reject less by going over on the uh, those uh, low x's, which aren't very good. And then a little more, and a little more, and a little more, and more, and more, and more. And I'm getting close to having 
the fraction in the red less than 0.05 and a little more and I'm done. Now I have found the rejection region where I allow, where I'm mostly rejection, rejecting for big X's and small P values. And I've learned that from the top, from the red points. Okay, and now I've just flipped it back. That's exactly the same figure, except now I'm showing it with the axis being log 10 p value. So you can, it exaggerates the, the small values. And you can see that was that curved, I found that curved blue line there. Okay, so how do we, how do we learn that red line? And of course that red line can be in very high dimensions, but I can show it best with a scalar. Um, we can't break, we can't cheat. We can't break the symmetry between the red and the blue regions. We can never look at the p-values that are in the red and the blue regions, but we can mask the data so that it's legal. So every p-value that's in the black region, we can see. So we can see that p-value, we can see the x, the side information associated with it. But we can see something about the ones in the red and the blue. We will say, we don't know what the p-value is. It's either p or it's one minus p, and we're not told which one it is. So that mask, that clever masking, lets us get a lot of information without actually cheating, because a very small p-value is either really significant or really not significant. And so we can use that. And this is gonna help us to decide where to draw the line. And each step, we get more black points until we can never backtrack because once they're in the black region, we've seen them and we can't go back. Okay, so now the point is, is we have to know to model the local false discovery rate. So at each step, we're going to have a probability model that says, what's the probability that that point is actually null given the side information and given the masked, the masked values, the P1 minus P. And we're gonna remove the hypothesis, each step we're gonna remove the, the SNP that has the highest estimated probability of being null. So it's rejected, but we shouldn't. It's the least likely to be associated. And so to do that, we need to build two models. One of them, we need to build a model for the probability of the hypothesis being non-null based on the side information. And the other one is we have to say, well, given that it's non-null, how, how uh, strong the signal does it have? What do we think the true log p-value is for that x. So that's what we need to do. And why are we doing that? Be we're going to, we want to, we want to compute this uh, condition, this local FDR. And we have to, to do that, we have to have a model for the p-values. And our model is a mixture model. We, we say pi one as a function of x is the fraction that are non-null. So one minus pi one of the p-values with that level of x are null, so they follow the uniform distribution. And then the other fraction has to follow a distribution that says that the p-values tend to be small. And the easiest thing to use for that distribution is beta distribution with its uh, mean piled up near, near the, uh, with very small p-values. So that's a natural thing and it has the one parameter, which is a parameter of how big is the signal in that the mean parameter of the beta as a function of the side information. And if we estimated those two things, the pi one and the mu, which are needed in that calculation, we can get this local FDR. And how do we do it? Very cleverly with the EM algorithm. What we do is we duplicate the data. So all of the mass p-values appear in our data once as p and once as one minus p. We don't know which one is the true one. And then the EM algorithm imputes weights, which allows us to upweight 
the right one and downrate the wrong p-value when there's enough information for it. When there's not much information, then they're about half and half. And this allows us to figure out which is the least promising SNP. We remove it, we refit S to put it in the, in the not rejected set. We keep making our rejected set smaller and smaller as I showed in the, uh, the animation before. Okay, so what do we, what are the assumptions? And this is really very important. It's surprising how often this assumption isn't met. So you have this, the first thing you have to check if you're gonna try this algorithm. The mere, we're relying very heavily on the mere conservative idea. That is, we're using the p-values near one in order to figure out whether we're controlled or not. So we need for the, um, under the null hypothesis, the fraction that are less than t, the greater than one minus t has to be equal to the fraction less than t. And um, here's uh, an example that's not mere conservative. We're missing some p-values up there near one, and that'll make a huge difference. We'll make a lot of false positives if we happen to have a test. How would this happen? The test isn't properly calibrated. So we said it followed a chi-square one, but it didn't. And so we didn't get enough p-values up near one. And so then when we're trying to figure out uh, what our false positive rate is, we can't, we can't use that mere conservative. Okay. Now, it's legal if there's a pile up of p-values near one, but it's very low power. That's very bad too, because you, you, you get a test that doesn't perform well. So we, we need to have tests that are well calibrated under the null are uniformly distributed. Okay. So at any rate, we're pretty excited. This is back when we were working on so very excited about this using ADAPT. It was perfect for our genetic problem because we had a lot of a lot of information that we wanted to find. And so in our literature search, we found this paper from um, um, Korthauer and um, they um, said they had a practical guide to controlling false discoveries in computational biology. We thought, wow, they scooped us, they already did it. But then they said, they said, oh, ADAPT is terrible, it doesn't work. Weakly informative covariates degrade the performance and it requires a careful specification of the functional relationships. So it's, and they often got no discoveries at all. So this seemed bad, but we went ahead and, and looked anyway to see if we could do better. So let's look at what the story is. You have p-values, you have covariates, which are your features or your side information. Those go into the ADAPT machine. It knows what to do with those, but it, you must model these parameters, the non-null probability as a function of the covariates and the strength of the signal as a function of the covariates. You have to have a model. And of course it has to be a good model. So when, when uh, Korthauer et al. said that it suffers when those things are bad, but those are the classic modeling problems. Any model suffers when those are bad. That's what our job is, is to make good models for those. And so it turns out that the off-the-shelf version of ADAPT just had the most naive of statistical input, just generalized linear models, which would um, um, lead people to fit their covariates in an additive way and perhaps at least approximately linear. It's not a very sophisticated way of putting in a very high dimensional and possibly many covariates that you put in are not very good. And this is not a very good way of modeling that. So that's probably why they didn't find anything. So our job was then to do, to solve the right hand of this, the modeling procedures. And so um, we thought, well, we have a very high dimensional problem. And whenever they do 
uh, competitions, who always wins, it's a uh, gradient boosted trees. So we, we try gradient boosted trees. So the idea is that of the boosting is that you, you fit a very simple model, but you do many, many steps. The first step, maybe, maybe you get that that tree and that path has a very predictive for, for what we're modeling. And, but then we've still made a lot of errors. So we add in another small tree and then we see, oh, where we make an error is we add in more and more and more and more trees. And eventually we have many, many simple models that add together and we can capture very complex nonlinear relationships and interactions. And this kind of model is very good for um, high dimensions with some uninformative covariates. So that's where we went with. And um, remember, we wanted to model the non-null probability, and then we wanted to model the strength of the signal. And so we used logistic for the first and gamma for the second. And we did all this using the XGBoost software, which I think is, is really marvelous software to, for, for this kind of problem. So we did that. And now my graduate student, uh, Ron Yurko, um, suffered for months and uh, found out that many, many, many details matter. The parameter space for cross-validation, the frequency of cross-validation, uh, frequency, it's very expensive to keep doing the EM algorithm in this huge space. And, um, and even where you, you started your lines, should you start them at 0.45 or should you go more towards a sensible 0.05 for the starting rejection? And so um, he worked out many of these details and you can find them on the, uh, on the GitHub uh, repository for the software. Okay, so how did it work out? So re remember we were going to, we're interested in autism actually, but we're gonna, we're gonna learn on schizophrenia because there's a lot known about schizophrenia. And so we can use the 2014 data and then we, we could also validate with newer data. And, um, and since bipolar is, is very, um, uh, gen highly correlated genetically, so we're using bipolar, uh, GWAS for one of our side information. We're going to use gene expression. And what kind of gene expression? Well, schizophrenia seems pretty clear that we ought to use brain tissues. So we use the brain bar data um, for our uh, gene expression side information. And um, I think so, so the way we want to use that brain expression is we want to figure out what are the EQTLs and what does that mean? It's the SNPs that as the SNP varies across its uh, genotypes um, is highly correlated with the expression of that gene. So we want to use that. What we're gonna use is the magnitude in absolute value of the slope. And that'll be one of our bits of side information, a, a SNP that, that drives a gene and drives it with a lot of signal is likely caught, uh, not necessarily causal, but likely causal. The other thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take that, those gene expression in brain var. Brain var is uh, brain expression and it's for, in the developmental ages, it goes from uh, fetal up to um, um, teenagers. And so it seems like the right range of data, valuable data for schizophrenia risk. So in those data, we, uh, we assume it's approximately block diagonal. We find the, the communities of genes. And so, and this great software from uh, Zhang and Horvath called Wigna, and you color, you use colors to describe the different, um, Core commu gene communities. And so like we have a, a yellow community and a turquoise community, and those are the correlated genes. And we're gonna, we're gonna use that as side information too. So SNPs get assigned to modules because they drive a gene and then the gene is in 
that correlated set of genes. And so it would be called, say, the turquoise. That SNP goes with the turquoise module. OK, so finally, here, here's our data. And um, this is um, the um, um, QQ plot for, oops, for SNPs. And you can see that there's definitely a signal in that data. If we look at all SNPs, those are the blue points. But we're going we're gonna to restrict ourselves to the only the SNPs that are eSNPs. And you can see that there's a lot more signal in those eSNPs. And also, we want our SNPs to be, they don't have to be independent, but we, want, we don't want them to be highly correlated or FDR won't work very well. So we're only testing the eSNPs. And so that's the input data, the bipolar GWAS and the gene expression for brain VAR. And we're gonna test these 25,000 eSNPs. Okay, so let's see, what do we have to do here? We have uh, the, the GWAS summary statistics. We're gonna have to select out the eSNPs. We're gonna join all that information. Now we have an X side information, high dimensional side information and the p-values. We pop that into the ADAPT machine and we start the algorithm with some generous cutoff. We started at, we're gonna reject every p-value less than 0.05. And then we look at that and we say, is the false discovery rate less than 0.05 say, or alpha? No, of course it isn't. So then we, we use the Eon algorithm to, to discover what's the worst SNP that we rejected. We throw it out, we update our line, we do this again, 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 again. But it doesn't take, it doesn't, it, it converges in a reasonable amount of time. And when finally, we get the new rejection set. We look at the mirror conservative. We see have we controlled the false positive rate, and when we have, then um, we uh, return our rejection set. And we look to see what we got, and we want to compare this with um, um, various ways of choosing the side information to see when we get the most discoveries, and we start our search with we're only going to reject the p-values um, less than 0.05. If you remember right, we had about 25,000 SNPs we were working with. Is that right? Yes. And we right away, we revealed most of them. So our black region re reveals the majority, 21,000 of the SNPs. And now we that, that way our algorithm, because remember the EM algorithm has to have something to get going, then it works very well. And we can then find, um, we can upweight and downweight based on the features until we get um, um, a more powerful test. So how much more powerful is it? All right, so remember we have all these, look on the bottom here, we get 300, well, first you can just see overall, this is if we don't use any covariates, we just do FDR. That is adapt with the intercept only is just basically an FDR controlling. And you can see there's some, there's of course the big strong signal on chromosome six in the, in the HLA region. There's a number of signals, but once we put our covariates in there, we get, whoops, we get a lot more signals. And the signals are not just all piled up in the same LD friends, but they're spread out over the genome. And so let's see, how did it go? And the, look at the bottom of these bars here. If we use the intercept only, we have 361. Now, if we take a very simple model and only put in the bipolar, we only get three more discoveries. Now, if we add in the EQTL slope, so we get, another 110, but not that much more. Now, if we throw in the, um, the G modules, we, we get another, um, you know, another increment. And even if we just put in the G modules by themselves, we get the most, as long as we allow for complicated interactions between those modules, we get 100, up to 603, so almost twice as many as we started with. But if we put the full power of XG boost fitting with um, many 
simple trees, but adding together with interactions, we get all the way up to 843 discoveries. And these discoveries, so we, we found a lot more discoveries. And even if you count them based on correlated sets, we get a lot of more um, independent regions. So it, it did work very well. And we published that in PNAS in 2020. And now I want to show you a little bit about, because I know most of you are, this is machine learning. So you want to know, how did we look at this after the fact? So you, you can analyze your trees based on the relative importance of your variables. And remember, the tricky part of this is we keep running the ADAPT model again and again and again as we, at each step, we change our, our, um, our curve. And so a variable can be very important in the early steps and somewhat less important in the later steps. So you can see that the bipolar, um, even though, now remember bipolar didn't help at all by itself, but in conjunction with the other ones, it is by far the most important variable. And so um, another one that's very interesting here is this gray line. And that, that's a variable that was very unimportant in the beginning. But as we get towards the final steps, it becomes quite important. And that is the Wigner gray module, which seems quite weird because if you know about Wigner, the gray module is the module that um, the gray module is the module that's uncorrelated, the genes that are uncorrelated with all the other genes. And the way this plays a role in our fitting is it any SNP that maps into that gray module gets downweighted relative to the others in that. Um, and that helps us a lot in the later steps when we're really refining things. And then the salmon module was important early on and then becomes less important. Let me show you what, how that was. So if you look at the SNPs that map to the salmon module, you see on the bottom histogram, there's a lot of small p-values, but the SNPs that don't map to the salmon module or closer to uniform distributed. So we upweight the SNPs in the salmon module and we find them early on. Okay, so now we're finally, so um, I'm kind of wrapping up on that subject, but um, just saying that we, we, we did find a lot of extra SNPs because of the side information. And we didn't worry too much about the fact that our SNPs were somewhat correlated due to LD, but um, because ADAPT maintains FDR if the, with this amount of correlation, but still correlation is really an issue when we're testing. And so we want to move on. We might prefer to do gene level analysis because we can put all the, we put the we believe we can put the correlated SNPs together and draw conclusions about genes. This might boost our power because we have fewer hypotheses to test and it certainly improves our interpretability. So, um, um, so that was the next thing we tried. We wanna put the p-values together and, and do a te gene testing, but we have to account for the, the LD within a, within a gene. And so, so we look in the literature and there's a, a method called MAGMA and it is a really popular method. It, even though it's relatively new to the scene, it has um, 1200 Google Scholar citations. I'm maybe probably, probably more every minute. And, um, and the MAGMA computes the gene level p-values by uh, using Fisher's test um, and a correction for correlation. This is an old correction from 1975, but there's a little, whoop, a little problem with that correction. It's a correction for one-sided test of significance. So wait a minute, SNP tests are two-sided. Will that be a problem? Well, so we, 
we run their software and we look at our histogram of p-values. This is for autism. And we're happy, happy to see that big spike near zero. But there's a very serious problem here. We're not going to be able to use, we don't have mere conservative. There are p-values that are missing over in the right-hand side. So while the magma uh, authors aimed to fix, they aim to fix this problem of the one-sided, two-sided test. They managed to fix it mostly over on the left. The small p-values are pretty close to correct, but they, they failed to fix that dearth of big p-values. And most people think that doesn't matter, but it really matters for FDR. You have to, not just for ADAPT, just in general, FDR needs the uniform p-values. And so um, uh, some other authors in 2020 used MAGMA with an FDR test. And for the low, so, and then we corrected MAGMA, we fixed that uniform distribution. And it was shocking how many false discoveries they had. So for skits, so look down there, the orange ones, we, um, we also found those genes and the gray ones are ones that didn't, didn't replicate when we fixed the uh, p-values. And so you can see for schizophrenia, oh, it's 13% of them were false. But if you roll back to autism, um, almost you know about half of them were false, more than half of them were false. And the reason is because the lower the power the more important the distributional assumptions in autism and ADHD are the lowest power of the uh, psychiatric um, disorders, and then schizophrenia is a more powerful. So it real that that mere conservative really matters, and so um, um, so anyway, we did we did fix that, and then we so once we started worrying about correlation and I need to wrap up soon. But when we started worrying about correlation, we thought, what about those, what about say if P3 is the causal one, that's gonna be correlated with P4, which is in the neighboring gene. And that's gonna cause problems too, because we're probably gonna, we should reject gene one, but now we're also gonna reject gene two due to that. Um, bleeding of LD, and that'll be a problem because people will try to interpret that gene. It's worse than SNPs because people don't interpret SNPs, but they really interpret genes. So that's going to be a problem. And so what we recommended is you find the genes that have a lot of bleed over correlation and you analyze them as a unit. And so um, I'm going to, I'm running out of time here. So we just, you can look at our paper for that. But we, uh, we are flexible with plus minus five minutes. So, oh, so okay, okay, I'll slow down a little then. So what we do is we look to we we first we we take the positional SNPs, we put the e SNPs into the genes, then we merge loci that have a lot of correlate correlations. So we merge genes A and B there. We leave gene C separate, and then we now we have um, loci, some of which are one gene, some of which are several or two genes. And we analyze them. Everything's, we can control the FDR very well there. And then after the fact, we'll zoom in on the multi-gene loci and try to figure out what is the causal one. Although that, that's still just an exploratory analysis, but at least we never, we never call out a gene that's totally just correlated as an independent discovery. So now this, this figure, which my student made is a little too complicated. Just ignore everything except the top three bars of the three phenotypes. And so the black bar is just, if you just did Benjaminian Hotchberg and the orange bar 
is if you did um, adapt with only, but not with no covariates. And the blue bar is when you put in some side information, because that's our goal is to have side information help. Now we get a lot of discoveries for autism, more um, like 125 genes. And the side information helped us a lot. Now, and some of the side information was uh, gene expression. We also used schizophrenia, which is correlated. And we used educational attainment. And surprisingly enough, educational attainment in Europe um, is quite highly genetic and very well studied and correlated with autism. Um, and so we put those in and we found more for autism. But what was also interesting is that the side information helped a lot for a low powered test, some for a moderate powered test like schizophrenia and really hardly at all for educational attainment because that's very highly powered because it's an easy, an easy phenotype to measure. So there's a lot of data. So side information is best when you need it and not so useful when you don't need it. And so, and then that's our, uh, I mean, um, my student made the application for viewing where the signal is and I'll let you look at that on your own. So we're moving towards for the last step of his PhD to try to move from common variants to rare variants. And it's gonna be really hard but there is a lot of side information that we can pull in. And so I'm hoping that by next year, we'll have a paper uh, trying to find, to interpret whole genome signals. So let me summarize then. I wanna bridge the gap between selective inference methods. There's such beautiful machine learning methods in that area, and almost none of them are applied to real data. And so what we tried to do was get practical applications in genetic studies um, so that we could actually achieve the promised um, uh, increases in power. And we feel that we did do that. So we have these three papers. The one in PNAS is the main one I talked to you about, about the SNPs. And then we, like, we, we have a couple of papers that are about moving to gene level test. And, um, what we learned from all of this is it is possible to greatly improve the power by incorporating multi-omic information, but it has to be done with a great deal of care so that you, um, not just so that you avoid false positives, but if you don't do it with a lot of care, you don't get any improvements. So good modeling is the secret to good results. So I'll stop at that point. Thank you. And we thank you. And we send you a round of, of virtual applause here <laughs> on, on, uh, on Zoom. That was fascinating, uh, an extremely important topic. It also unified several uh, topics that were mentioned in the earlier talks today, like multi-omics and, and, uh, and uh, making discoveries uh, through data integration. This is ex was extremely exciting. So are there questions from the Zoom audience? Yes, there is one. Lucas, one of our students, in the doctoral students in the network. He, Lucas Miranda will go first. Thank you, Carson. Thank you very much, Catherine, for such an interesting talk. I have two questions, if I may, if I have the time. Please. One, just out of uh, ignorance, and uh, it's something that you may have mentioned during the talk, but I, I either didn't pay enough attention or I didn't understand. When you compare different methods to threshold p-values, for example, and um, you say that one yields more discoveries than the other. How do you assess, how do you compare true positives with false positives? And this um, through okay. cross that's a, that's a very, that will, go ahead, you wanna ask your second question and make a unified question. Okay. Uh, yeah, the, the second question has nothing to do with it. <laughs> oh, okay, then hold, hold that one until I answer this one. Okay, we don't know what is the truth. So um, we, we can't know that those results are Definitely true. Um, we did um, um, we 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 did that that analysis on schizophrenia in 2014 data, and then there's been publications since then. 
and we we got uh, the expected level of, uh, of um, you know we you know that the new data supported the findings that we had and and we felt happy with that but that's all we can know can't know for sure if they were true um, likewise when we did our gene test then we found that the the genes were uh, enriched in the genes that we expect but you never know for sure we believe it's true but we don't know thank you any question second question Okay, uh, yeah. <laughs> so from my limited understanding of these psychiatric diseases that you mentioned, such as schizophrenia, for example, there is a lot of um, hypothesized heterogeneity behind them. Like um, there are people saying that many of the diseases are defined based on symptoms, but there might be different biological entities behind them. Uh, do you have an opinion on whether this can have a high impact, impact on the GEO studies? Because if the labels that we have are uh, representing different genetic entities, for example, this might yes, be. that that is that is a very good question, and, and I I commend you for asking it because I've never given a talk when somebody didn't ask that question, and the um, the thing is, is that people you know different people with autism you know I mean it could say say for instance autism is the one that they say it the most about, and some are very high functioning, some can barely talk. And these differences, you would think, you would think it would make sense to partition your analysis by these different categories. That never works. I don't, I think that the truth is, is that people have multiple hits. Um, having autism is really kind of like being, I mean, being tall or being short. There are many, many, many different SNPs acting on that. And so this, it's the severity and the slight differences. Don't, don't borrow from the fact that they do have the same problem. The brain is not wired quite the same. I mean, there's the big hits that make you have a very, very low IQ. That's kind of set that aside. The ones that cause us to have social challenges, those are... Some of us have more or worse social challenges, but they're still social challenges. And so, but when people partition the data, they find nothing. So they go from, you know, seemingly meaningful to nothing. Thank you. Then another question by Julia. Hello, thank you so much for uh, your talk. It was really, really interesting. Uh, uh, my question um, is very much related to the first question uh, from Lucas. So I was um, I was interested in knowing uh, what you're using um, uh, when you have like uh, results for natural phenotypes, as you um, as you mentioned. What you're using for uh, analyzing those results and for um, understanding if those results are actually meaningful or or not. So it's very much uh, related to his question. Okay, that, 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 that's a very good question. Um, I, w I wish I, I had a much better answer. Um, the, one, the first thing that we did was we, um, uh, we looked at the, 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 the newest data set, which was at that time, 2018. And we, and we were able to statistically work back, the, the data is all pooled together, but we were able to statistically work backwards and figure out the strength of the new test from the new data by subtraction. So now we have the, the second, like 25% um, of the data that's come in recently. And now that's not well powered enough to replicate these, these things, but at least we can see, it, do, we get, um, do we get like a 0.05 kind of level of significance in um, the, um, the SNPs that we found. And, um, and even then you don't always, because these things are all right on the border of significance, but we get, we did a simulation to see how many would you expect to replicate if everything that you had was true. And we got, we got what we, what we got what we'd expect. So if you can look in the, the, the supplement of the PNAS paper to see how we did that, because it was, it was tricky. And um, 
And so we, we were able to replicate as many as we thought we would if our, if our, if our um, findings were all true. And so, so we felt that that was um, a good replication study, not perfect. Um, then the other things, we do the same things everybody does. You know, we, we look to see if, we, if the results are meaningful. Do, do you get a lot of results that um, fall in certain pathways? And, um, and we didn't, but neither does anybody else because schizophrenia is, a broad, broad, it's not like, it's not like the type one diabetes where you, you know it's the pancreas. The brain, like the brain is like, I, I study only brain things. The brain's like everything. Almost every gene is um, uh, brain expressed and, and a lot of little things can go wrong that can cause you to be mentally ill. It's a, it's a miracle that we're all, we're mostly healthy, <laughs> given how many little things can happen. So we were not able to replicate our work in schizophrenia by using sort of those kind of enrichment results. But we did analyze uh, type 1 diabetes when we knew what to expect, and it came out perfect. We got good enrichment of exactly the things that we all know cause type 1 diabetes. So that is a good way to check for phenotypes that you understand better, like you know the lipid things and those kind of phenotypes, not so good for the brain ones. Does that answer? Yes, thank you so much for this answer. And I would definitely have a look at the paper. Thanks a lot. Okay. Are there further questions? If not, I would have a question. If I rem recall correctly, then you mentioned in the beginning that the covariate information should be independent from the information that you are testing, like the genotypic information. Um, how, how can you guarantee that this is the case or what would happen if it is not fully independent? Uh, can you detect this empirically? Um, ah. So how can yes. this uh, affect your approach? Yeah. Yes, yes, no, absolutely. I thought about that because I... Uh, um, um, what, what that means is like, you wouldn't, I mean, of course they're correlated in the same, I mean, are they conditionally independent? Because of course you want them to be correlated, right? But you want them to be independent in terms of the measurement errors of yep. them. And so you wouldn't want to use the same, like if you had a GWAS for the same subjects, and you measured, let's say you measured educational attainment on them and also uh, whether they had autism or not, that would be wrong, right? The correlation, because any measurement errors would be the same, the causing the same, same small p-values. And so that, that would be um, uh, unacceptable. But the fact that you use, um, like, like when I use the, um, the bipolar, those were different subjects, but we believed that the, the underlying signal was the same. That's good. That's the kind of correlation that you want, but not, not false correlations. Thank so it's you. really the measurement, are the measurement errors correlated? Yes. Thank you for that. So we've come to the end of this uh, one hour presentation. Catherine, like all external speakers, has, has kindly agreed to also meet the uh, the doctoral students of our network for, for half an hour and to, to give them advice and feedback on career and re research issues. Uh, that, that's wonderful. So we also thank you for that and and for the excellent presentation that you've given here. It's very was a very uh, thought stimulating um, um, and an excellent talk. So that, that was great. And uh, thanks a lot, the, the PIs and the YouTube audience say goodbye to you now. Thank you very much, Catherine. And uh, the doctoral students will take you to a, to a breakout room. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. And we'll be back here in the general audience in half an hour. Krista Fischer will present at 4.30.